So welcome everyone to another session of Emerging Topics in Biomolecular Magnetic Resonance, who is organized by a group of us, but actually on behalf of ICMRBS and uh, Euromar. The goal of this uh, series is actually to present frontier research in magnetic resonance applied to biological systems. And today we have a very vibrant session uh, with uh, two fantastic speakers, Roland Rick and uh, Patrick van der Vel. Uh, remember that you should not uh, record or take the lectures because they will be recorded for you and then distributed through the ICMRBS YouTube channel. And also, uh, please type and vote, uh, on, well, type the, your questions on the Q&A or in, in case that you also want to uh, talk in the informal session, raise your hand uh, to speak uh, afterwards. And this is just a reminder of uh, uh, of the ICMRBS conference, and with no more dilation, uh, I will start introducing the, the first speaker of, of this session, who is uh, Roland Rick. Roland Rick studied physics at the ATH, where he then uh, also did his graduate studies under the supervision of uh, Professor uh, Kurvitrik, and uh, in there he, uh, he, he did uh, several studies, including the, the mouse prion protein, who he developed and published in 1998. He then uh, did also a few postdoctoral years at the ETH, but then he moved to, um, uh, to Salk Institute uh, in, in La Jolla for, for a several number of years, where he uh, was appointed in different positions. But he decided uh, to move back to Switzerland in 2007, where he uh, joined back uh, ETH, and he's currently a full professor of physical chemistry uh, in, uh, in this institution. Uh, Ron is very well known in the field and he, he uh, develops uh, many aspects of uh, NMR spectroscopy, including, of course, uh, protein structure determination, protein dynamics, and uh, methodology for the above mentioned. And he's interested in uh, many interesting biological uh, systems, including, for instance, uh, amyloid uh, systems and systems that, uh, that undergo also with uh, different uh, conformations. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, uh, to your talk, uh, Roland, so the floor is yours. So thanks a lot for the kind introduction. I would like also to thank the organizer for doing this. I think it's really an important uh, thing that we meet, that we listen, what is going on uh, in other labs. And it's a great opportunity to talk to you today about something we recently studied, started, uh, um, one thing is about automated uh, structure determination, which I will start. And the second is about multi-state structure determination. So an automated structure determination, Piotr Kukowski, who is a machine learning expert, uh, joined my group. And it started with a uh, wake up moment. Uh, I was 11 o'clock in the night in the bed working on the assignment of a protein. And my wife uh, was reading a book, looks at me and says, what, you're still doing the same thing as during your PhD in 1998, which I just heard. <laughs> and so I said, that cannot be, I said. And together with Peter Günther, everybody knows here, the book of Siana, we started to look into this. So the idea is that we just collect spectra, like the three dimensional noses or HCCH toxi. Um, the, the backbone experiments, HNCACB, that we just collect data and spectra. Then that we use machine learning to pick the spectrum. Then we do this flyer, which was established by, by Peter Günther, sequential assignment, that then we get partial sequential assignment that using the BMRV database with machine learning, that's called deep graph neural network, add probabilities for additional assignments close in close vicinity to the main assignment, go back, start again flyer, and then go for structured determination. So, so far we introduced machine learning in step one here, peak picking and machine learning in assignment, but we didn't do yet any machine learning for the structure determination. What I will show you is the following thing. You measure NMR spectra, just load up the spectra, and five hours later you get the structure back. 
There is no human intervention anymore, just everything automatized. However, the main problem for machine learning is you need a benchmark, right? You need data that is available. Now, there are several thousand NMR structures deposited at the PDB database, but there is no real data deposited. And this is a huge criticism I have, including to myself, to the NMR community, and I am part of it, that we didn't do this. We don't have the data there. So we said, okay, we need data. Why not making a homepage and wrote the emails uh, to everybody that deposited the PDB NMR structure? We got almost no response because we know everybody was, including myself, is so much work. We have so many different spectra. We transform them differently. They are in different formats. It is a mess, okay? But we need them. So I got internal resources a little bit and the help within ETH from Fred Allen, a few structures. That was it. Then we looked into the BMRB. The BRB you can upload, but not in a good format. It's a total mess. So you may have an HSQC uh, or an HCCH toxic that has, uh, looks like that, or you may also have it oriented 90 degree off. Uh, you may have CMC alpha, some noses shifted by 2 ppm. This doesn't matter if you do one structure. It doesn't matter. You can always work on it, right? You have a little bit of shifts, you move the peaks. But if you want to do 100 data sets, not possible. So Piotr was able to go with a database crawler through the whole database, looks where are raw files, where are uh, some often you have a lot of different transformation files in there. He was transforming them, got the structure from the shifts, selecting for it. Actually, I didn't know, but in machine learning, 60% of the time is getting the data right in the right format. It's like teaching a kid. You need to have simple, everything simple at the beginning. So he was able to get data for 100 monomers. Uh, of proteins with size 35 to 175. In average, we have about 12, 13 NMR spectra. So we got total about 1,300 NMR spectra, and we expect there about 1.6 million peaks. But you need to annotate this. So one thing is, we first we had to see whether with the data in hand, that means chemical shift assignments, nosy, um, all the other spectra, can we get cyan structure automation working? And we got that for all of them. It's about uh, up to an RMSD of two angstrom. Then the next thing is we had to look manually at 5,000 planes of spectra. Here is, I just show you an HNCA projection with nitrogen carbon, because you get assignment as shown here, the assignment of the peak, um, may be based on the nosy or an average one, but it's not perfectly for HNCA. So you have to adjust them. So we went through 1 million peaks, annotating them. He, Piotr made a, a, a software, it just came tack, 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 and you just watch whether it is right picked or not. Um, later, we had to also to pick overlap peaks, and we'll come back to that. Then one needs to understand, is a peak something isolated? So that's what would be the peak, so one would take just the square around it. Or do you go for a strip? A strip has much more information because we know that peaks are connected with each other. And so with that, we started a deep learning graph that I'm showing you here. Just want to highlight you, after collapsing all the data to a vector of 128 um, dimensions, you can reconstruct, that's a reconstructed nosy. Um, so this is really working very, very well. So I show you here a carbon C13 proton HSQC and only the C alpha region, and I will zoom in now to show you how good that is. So we have two, we had two levels. The first level was, okay, every peak is only coming once, that is the blue peaks. So th th this, this approach, this, this deep learning approach couldn't yet look at overlapping peaks. So you see here, there is, a, there is another peak below it. So we went and, and picked 80,000 overlapping peaks by hand. And now the second learning, it, it also finds, and I think this is, I really appreciate that, it really picks also overlapping peaks, right, very well. It 
this this peak picker is not picking water, is not picking T1 noise, it's not picking the diagonal. Um, it's really going for it. So now we have a peak pick automated. So with flyer, how good we are. And we have four approaches here. That is approach is based on small amount of spectra. That is based on large amount of spectra. That is in addition, if, if you have overlap of peaks. And that the best scenario is when we also take into account the chemical shift assignment extension. Once you get in flyer partial assignment, we use the BMRB database to predict neighboring assignment. So it's the best thing. So out of the data set, um, everything is screened off. We then evaluated that and we get in average about 90% of the chemical shifts correctly predicted. Of the backbone, you can see it's almost 100%. Side chains is a problem a little bit. And the main problem are actually the aromatics. So with, with all the approach we have here with 100 data sets, we can really see what are the problems, which spectra are important. So the aromatics um, are a problem because in most of these data sets, there are no experiments done to connect the backbone with the side chain in terms of not through space, not the nosy. So no, nobody measures the K experiment um, where we connect the C beta over the C gamma to the C delta. Uh, almost nobody measures uh, HTCH toxi with, with hard pulses as uh, Christian Griesing demonstrated or uh, Alvar Gossert did. So that is not measured. And this is making us a problem, uh, but that we can improve because now we know we need these experiments, um, but that's a, a small problem that may be for larger systems, very important. So now we have chemical shift assignments. We go for structure determination and I just concentrate on this approach here, the best approach. And you can see all um, protein folds converged with an RMSD of about 1.5 angstrom. So, the, the, the earlier ones didn't work yet. They had always some structures that did not work. Now, I want to see whether I can show you the movie of all the structures. In yellow is the deposited structure and in blue is the predicted structure. And there, of course, we have always the bundles that uh, come along with it. And I hope you appreciate uh, how, how well they are superimposing is. Um, some of them uh, don't superimpose entirely. There are some loops uh, they were wrongly done and they are, um, they are because of the aromatics. You have aromatic experiments that we can measure, but nobody measures them. But that's how it is. And I'm very, I mean, uh, we, we, we now started to do that. We have uh, in our lab too, we have uh, 18, killed all the proteins, this is just five hours. It really takes five hours to get the structure. And it, we are happy if somebody wants to try out, we are happy at the moment to, to say, okay, we do that for 10 people. But what we are actually hope for is that in the summer, we have an automatic server, people can upload and can just run it. It will have an additional point of interest because we will get more data. And if you have more data, we can also look into the structure determination approach with machine learning, which we cannot do yet. It's only 100 structures. So that's what, where we are and um, on the scope of, of automated structure determination. We will, of course, focus further on it. And uh, we want to also extend it to the multi-state structure determination part, which I would like to talk about now using exact NOEs. So the NOE is a complex interplay, an NOE between two spins, K and L, is a complex interplay um, because of there is fast dynamics and slow dynamics present. But in structured regions, not in arching in side chains, license side chains, the fast motional part can be neglected. And then the NOE can be related to an ensemble averaged entity. And we collect many of them, as you know. 
just like to highlight here the, the example I would like to talk about is the, uh, the double double domain. Here, have a tryptophan it has four degrees of freedom here in the middle, but we have 30 distances since it's an accuracy of 0 0.1 angstrom. I mean, 0 0.1 angstrom is something like that, right? This is very, very accurate. And because you have a dense network that goes through the whole protein, you can really get correlated motional states. And we, uh, one example we selected recently was Alastair uh, in the double double domain that first by genetic analysis, evolutionary analysis uh, got um, established by Raman Ganathan and then the PEN group did very, very nice NMR work on it. So if a ligand binds here at the ligand binding site, it depends on the ligand whether this interaction between the double double domain is getting strengthened or weakened. And that you can even already see at the allosteric side. So one ligand, the positive allosteric ligand induces chemical shift far away from its binding site, actually not so far away because it's a small system, um, in this direction and the other one in the opposite direction. Now, when we look at the one state structure calculation of after collecting several hundred ENOEs, we find a lot of target function, high target function, because a lot of experimental restraints are not explained well. When you have two states, they explained much better the experimental data. And I just want to show you here, for example, these are the points we measure, right? These are the NOE buildup curves at different mixing times, and the two-state structure very well shows um, the, the, the superimposed with the experimental data. But this is here, this is the one-state structure. That's really far off. It looks much worse than it is in terms of distance because we have one over R to the power of six distance. But if you think about an NMR probe, then you would say, oh, that's terrible, that's terrible, that's terrible. So the two state is much better describing the experimental distances. And I show you here the double double domain, uh, and 20 conformers in cyan and 20 conformers in blue are, are representing the two states. And I think you can appreciate. So here is the, the, the ligand that binds. So this aromatic ring in the close to the ligand binding site has two states, but we also see the allosteric side here over there, two states, and I just rotate the molecule now. A little bit to, to show you. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was too fast. And so we have here also two states at the allosteric side. So it's a correlated motion throughout the entire protein. Now, what happens is when we go to the positive allosteric side, that the 80 20 mixture of populations we see switches to 20 80. And that's because we don't, we are not able to entirely. Um, um, add enough ligand. And so in this region where the allosteric side is, we have this trend in 29, and in cyan, you can see that's on the top, and here the alanine 31 is below. So I hope you can see that. And the, 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 the reds, the yellow state in the complex of the polis, positive allosteric ligand is exactly the same. Top, below, top, below. But in the negative allosteric ligand, we have top and again top, or we have below and the below. So the, the, the local conformation is the same, but in a different way. And when you now put the double double main two state structure on the crystal structure full length, what we see is the following that the highly populated state, that is the red state, in the positive allosteric ligand is actually not clashing into the catalytic side. So the pink is the catalytic side. But in the negative allosteric ligand, both states, the gray and the black, are clashing. So then the interaction is weakened. And so with, with, a, with, a, with a more a graphical sketch uh, cartoon, is the following. So in the free form, the upper state, the protein is having going, the double double domain goes into two states, force and back. The positive allosteric ligand just stabilizes one of the two states. But the negative allosteric ligand is going force and back like that, 
has a broad one here cannot interact, has a broad one here cannot interact, and it has a total different outcome. So these details we can look at, but we can go even further. And so we wanted to see whether we can go into a local thermodynamics by measuring now the ENU data sets at different temperatures. And actually that the melting temperature is at 53 degrees. And so what we're looking at is the two states exchange in a regime where there is no unfolding of the, the protein yet. But we can now have these two states. These two states, of course, um, have an equilibrium constant. Through the equilibrium constant, we can get energies and we can dissect them into the entropic and the enthalpic contribution. And we can now, because we measure at different temperature, either through a Van Toff equation or even including um, heat capacity issues, we can plot them because the ENOE, assuming that we have a two-state model, that because the ENOE is just having the proportionality of the populations between the two states in there. I just to show you the Van Toff equation with the logarithm of the equilibrium constant versus one over the temperature with the experimental ENOE data here at different temperature measured. And that is locally, or you can even have that in low, long range. So through space, we have a probe that measures us some thermodynamic values. We can also make the more complex approach with including the heat capacity. And now I show you here what, what we find. We find, and this is now, we call it, a, it's not really a melting temperature because we have two states that are interchange. And this two, okay, so it's really something happens here. So, so we have, it's a little bit slow somehow, this is zoom. We have two states inter-exchanging and at the, this temperature, 50% is in state one and 50% is in state two. And you can see that around 25 degrees, all this allosteric network I showed you before is somehow populated in both states. We have also at lower temperature, local events, and that's probably the Rottomer states that we pick up here. And of course we can now put in enthalpic contributions of between the two states and so on and so forth. And that will be very interesting. This is a, this is a model system that we know a lot. That will be probably very interesting when we go into ligand protein complexes in drug research to figure out what are the enthalpic and entropic contribution in the binding site. And the NOE is a probe. We can use that. Of course, we should not say local in terms of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is a macroscopic entity, but we can get insights into contribution, not like delta delta Gs. We don't make mutants, we just measure. And NMR is a great method to do so. So that's in principle what I wanted to tell you. Julian Orts will take the, this, this thermodynamics with him when he goes to Vienna. He has now a faculty position. And Piotr is the driving force together with Peter on the, on the automated structure determination. And Dean and Aditya, of course, and the whole ENOE stuff started with Beat, and we should never forget how important the Swiss cow is uh, for us to do good research. And I would like to thank for your attention. Thank you very much, Ron, for this impressive talk. Uh, not surprisingly, there are many questions already. Uh, I will start uh, shooting. So, uh, Katia Pittsburgh. Uh, said very interesting uh, a machine learning approach for assignment. Uh, can you also do it on RNA and what would be the, bottle, the bottleneck? So um, I think we can also do it for RNA. Actually, we just wrote the grant um, to, to do it for RNA. Peak picking should work, I think, uh, independently. Um, it should just work. Yeah, I don't see any problems. Mm -hmm. Madeleine Sutherland asks, did the spectra used for training include any proteins with bound metals and a ligand? With, with metals, you said? Yeah, I guess bound metals, yes. Um, no, but we had some RNA molecules bound um, in, in, some sort of, in certain proteins, which we didn't include. 
So it's not yet, but, but it's only a matter of implementation. Um, intermolecular NOEs we didn't yet implement. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so Ilya Kuprov uh, asks, why not generate the training data database computationally, taking into account all the various complications, language, variation, noise, and so on? Less data procurement, <laughs> <laughs> less data procurement heroics uh, would hopefully be needed. So, yeah, essentially. Yeah, so that, yeah, it would be an approach, right? You simulate everything and you try it out. So in the machine learning field, that's an approach that is used, but it's much weaker than with real data. That's what I, I'm not an expert in machine learning, but that's what I understand when I listen to these people. And um, we have now enough data. I think that, yeah, I was going to ask, like, could you, now that you have the database curated, include and expand it with the synthetic data uh, using machine learning to, to extrapolate that? It's absolutely a possibility. Um, it's a possibility. I don't, I think actually there are more important points to, to address at the moment, in particular, why and how can we bring the aromatic um, better? And, and then, and that's what we actually will use in silico data is for going from the hundred structures available to many structures. There we need simulated data because we don't have enough uh, structures. So there we will incorporate it. And uh, of course, what we also can do is we tried that already. You can take alpha fold, for example, predictions and use that also as an information content or a homologous structure. That is just, it's just easy. You just put that in and that's already implemented. Um, that's also a possibility. What didn't work was when we took the chemical shift, also it didn't work, it didn't improve, when we took the chemical shift based structures. Um, they didn't improve us. And uh, the problem with alpha fold is uh, that it is not available. Uh, the nature paper they put, we can't, it's not, it's not enough data in there that you can make it work. There was one paper out there that they tried, they, they showed um, that it works, but we compared it, it doesn't work very well. I really dislike this approach by Google because it's not, um, it's not scientific. Um, of course, commercially that's fine, but as a scientist, I must say, uh, it's not available for us because that would be great. Uh, as our additional sources. We don't need it, as you see. We don't need, we don't make secondary structure prediction, nothing, okay? We just use NMR spectra. An important thing maybe also to note is which NMR spectra are important. So when we take only the HNCACB, HCCH COSI, and the two noses, we get 85% converging. So, so we, we can optimize that. And with Brooker, actually, we started to talk that we will do it on the fly. So you just measure the NMR spectra, you do everything and you go back. So, so, that in, so the, my hope is that in a time span of one or two years, we, we just start to measure and get, I mean, of course, that Ilya's uh, ideas as well to, to be on the fly with, 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 uh, with, that you do it everything on the fly. Yeah. Thank you. So Walter Susan says, outstanding. Uh, the ability to assign complicated spectra is most important because not all applications of solution NMR are directed to structure determination. This was in the statement. Another question, uh, do you have a sense of how far up in molecular weight and a spectral overlap can a machine learning directed automated assignment be pushed? Uh, yeah. To be able to like to add also the signal to noise, like the concentration, the minimum concentration. So um, we don't know the concentration of these proteins the people deposited, okay? Um, at the moment, we are working on a 40 kilodalton protein. We, we just uh, select the, the detected data. Honestly, my feeling is that in um, five years, we will measure unlabeled protein noses at two different or three different temperatures where you get correlated shifts changes due to temperature and solve the structure. Overlap will be no problem anymore. There is something we never use. We are a quantitative method, but we don't use the intensity as a quantitative probe as cryo-EM is doing now. 
So when we take that also into account, I believe that really we can, uh, overlap is no issue because you know how many protons should be in there and um, that having enough data on structures and spectra interpreted by machine learning, they will do very complex uh, science and, and peak picking. Okay, there are more questions. Uh, perhaps I'll ask a couple more and then we, we move uh, to the next uh, talk and then leave the, the others for, for the informal session. But there are, there are a couple of uh, fast questions. Uh, Philip Newdecker says, uh, please, can you comment on how the disorder regions are treated in automated structure determination? How, which regions? The, the disorder regions. The, the um, yeah. um, they just get assignment and they don't get much long range enemies and then they are disordered as you usually do. They get not treated in, uh, different in terms of uh, that the correlation time is lower, but usually it's not a problem because the enemies are anyway weaker. Um, you have high intensity, but the enemies are weaker. Okay. And um, yeah, that's it. And then uh, Tobias model, oops, I don't know. Can you hear me, Roland? Because I, I can see that you froze your... Okay, I think that Roland had some problem with the connection and it's probably time to move on to the next speaker, so... Thanks, it's my pleasure then to introduce our second speaker for today, who's Patrick van der Vel. Patrick did his bachelor's in chemistry in the Netherlands at Utrecht University. He then went on to do a PhD in the United States with uh, Roger Coppa in uh, Arkansas. And then he did a postdoc with Bob Griffin in the Francis Spitter Magnet Lab where we overlapped for a little bit. Um, and then he went on to the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine as a professor, was tenured there and then recently came back to Europe uh, where he is now as an associate professor at the University of Groningen back in the Netherlands. And uh, Patrick has done a lot of work on membrane proteins and very repetitive fibrils in the past. And uh, today I'm looking forward to hearing about mobility and uh, activation of proteins. So please go ahead, Patrick. First of all, I uh, of course also want to thank the chance, uh, the organizers for the chance to talk here and uh, join the chorus of people saying that it's such a great resource to have uh, these talks now um, available across the world, basically. Um, and yeah, like uh, Lauren said, I, I recently moved back to the Netherlands, to uh, the city of Groningen in the northern part of the country. Um, but I put on the slide here still the, the affiliation with Pittsburgh as well, because uh, all the data that I'll talk about uh, is all still from uh, what people in the lab recorded in Pittsburgh. Um, and it's, but it's projects that we continue to work on. So hopefully there'll be more to report soon. And um, the main part of the talk, see if I can move my slide, yeah. So yeah, so my lab is um, uh, working on a couple of different things. I mean, traditionally mostly biology, but I actually now joined a uh, material science department with a strong physics background. And so we are looking a bit more into some more materials related topics, including the interface of biology and materials. But the, uh, the topic that I'll focus on today is more on our uh, protein lipid interactions, which is indeed where my scientific roots were um, uh, before really getting into the magic angle spinning NMR. That's now our main tool in the lab. But a big part of our work also focuses on uh, studies of uh, amyloid formation by polyglutamine proteins. And we, uh, I'll touch briefly at the end of my talk on a new paper that uh, we just have coming out that actually fits the topic of this talk, but there's no time to, to get into both topics at the, at the same time. But we, we're also interested in uh, protein misfolding in a general sense and, and, and the way uh, chaperones and oligomeric chaperones play a role in this. So yeah, so the focus that I wanted to take for this lecture today is to kind of talk a little bit about how we see uh, uh, dynamics in various protein complexes uh, with solid state NMR, which I think is going to be one of the really important fortes of the technique, uh, even as we go forward. And uh, so something that we are also very interested in. 
And so that's the topic here on the left, where we are looking at a protein lipid complex involved in uh, lipid peroxidation. And we found there are some interesting aspects of mobility making our uh, well, life hard as NMR spectroscopists, but it also uh, gives us some interesting insights into how the protein works. So I wanted to start taking a few steps back and, and yeah, looking at these beautiful uh, drawings and paintings by uh, David Goodsell. And you look at the cell, you see a lot of organelles uh, with membranes around them. Of course, these days people are particularly excited about membraneless organelles without lipids, but uh, in my talk now, I want to talk a bit about lipids and, and how they define organelles. And as you've probably heard many times before, we, it's really a mistake to think of lipids as just some inert layer that covers everything and doesn't do anything. It, it plays really important roles in signaling and in other functional processes. And that's what I want to look at a bit today. And then in particular, we'll look at uh, these mitochondria, so these organelles found throughout the cell uh, with lots of membrane uh, on the outside, but in particular within the organelle, uh, these cristae. So you have uh, two layers of lipids uh, in these mitochondrial uh, systems. And what is well known about mitochondria is that they act as the powerhouse of the cell. But uh, what is also very obvious is that they're a big source of problems when things go bad. Um, and so in many different diseases, uh, dysfunction in mitochondria plays a key role. And this becomes important in cancer studies, but it's also uh, irrelevant for uh, many neurodegeneration diseases like Parkinson's, Huntington's, and, and other disorders. And where we get a lot of um, yeah, attention is the fact that as part of this powerhouse function in the cell, there's a lot of uh, redox reactions going on, and there's a lot of risk of generating these reaction, reactive oxygen species and free radicals. And uh, this, of course, leads to advertisements such as uh, for these probably delicious drinks where you can get these uh, antioxidants that will suppress the radicals. But what I want to talk about today is also some processes where the uh, cell tries to yeah, do something with these free, free radicals and reactive oxygen species. And in particular, the effects of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species on lipids. So what people often see is that when you see the generation of this reactive species, you get oxidation of all sorts of things in the cell, DNA, proteins, as well as lipids. And it's tempting to see that as a uh, kind of bad thing that will just make things go bad, like make things uh, work inappropriately. But what uh, comes out of the work by my close collaborator, uh, Valerian Kagan, is also the idea that these oxidized lipid species can actually have a really important signaling roles in the cell. And we'll focus here today on this one particular process where uh, specific mitochondrial lipids, cardiolipin, uh, are being oxidized actively by, through a sort of enzymatic reaction, leading to the idea that this uh, generation of these oxidized lipids is actually not just a bad thing, but it's seen used by the cell as a signal that something has to be done. And in this case, it can lead to apoptosis, so programmed cell death. But it's really a proactive reaction where it appears that the cytochrome C protein is recruited to actively um, enhance and boost this oxidation process. So what happens is that you have the cytochrome C protein uh, modulating or modifying these uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids towards oxidized species, where you introduce now a hydrophilic group in the membrane, which of course has predicted and predictable uh, destabilizing effects. And so what we want to then try to understand is how does this cytochrome C uh, oxidation process exactly work? And if we indeed assume, and this is discussed in the review article that, that I just referenced, that um, it appears that this process is not just a kind of random process, but actually a regulated process with functional and signaling significance, can we uh, understand how it works, but also can we think of ways to regulate or suppress it? So that's sort of the the big story behind what we want to look at today. And it's really been shown that this cytochrome C effect, this, this reaction is uh, really critical for getting uh, apoptosis to occur. Now, I wanna take one quick step to sort of point out the uh, substrate of this reaction. So the substrate of this reaction is this cardiolipin lipid. And it's been studied by a number of uh, NMR groups uh, in various ways um, because it's really, 
critical for uh, the functioning and the structures of proteins in the mitochondrial membrane. And it's a bit of a funny lipid because it actually has four acyl chains and two phosphate groups. And I uh, decided to put a, one of our phosphorus magic angle spinning spectra in there to show that the two phosphates are, are equivalent. So they are exactly uh, symmetric and they give one peak in the phosphorus spectrum. And the second peak here is from the phosphatidylcholine. So you can in individually investigate these different lipid species. And what I point out here is that it's, it's uh, really critical for getting mitochondria to work properly, uh, but it's also increasingly seen as something that's recognized by a bunch of different proteins to trigger certain activity. And in the talk here, I'll talk about apoptosis, but we also have uh, some collaborative work where we're looking at uh, mem mitochondrial memory infusion and fission processes where cardiolipin is also important. So the, the topics that I wanted to tackle uh, today is this question of can we try to reconstitute this biological process in vitro to study it in some detail? Um, can we understand how this activity is kind of being regulated and what structural and dynamic changes in the protein and the lipids are associated? Uh, the pictures of the two people here are the people that did the bulk of the work. Uh, this Abhishek Mandala, a PhD student uh, that I had in Pittsburgh, and ming Ye Li, who uh, worked with me as a postdoc and is now working at uh, Merck in the States. So the bigger part of the project is a collaboration with this group of Valerian Kagan, uh, who actually discovered a big parts of this oxidation, lipid oxidation uh, process being involved in apoptosis. And what we were able to do with his collaborate, with a collaboration through with him is to do uh, lip, mass spec based lipidomics to see that indeed in our in vitro system we see the exact kind of lipid oxidation that we would expect. So what we make is lipid vesicles uh, at the cytochrome C and incorporate in these vesicles different kinds of anionic lipids including uh, single and polyunsaturated uh, cardiolipin variants. And then with the mass spec you can actually figure out exactly how it's being oxidized and pinpoint where, which places this occurs. And what this review, among other things, talks about is that this oxidation is not just chemically dictated where it happens, but there's actually deviates from where you would predict it to happen normally. So there's an enzymatic function that drives the oxidation of specific carbon sites. Now, the other interesting aspects of this is, is that you can bind cytochrome C, which is highly positively charged, to all sorts of negatively charged surfaces and membranes but you see that there's really a specific thing about cardiolipin, this mitochondrial lipids. So if you look at PG, which is sort of like half a CL, so this is CL with its four acyl chain, this is PC with two, it has half the charge, but also half the size, you see that its uh, activity is not equivalent. You see lower activity for these uh, PG species than compared to the CL variant. And in the case of CL, you have all sorts of interesting effects of the ratio of uh, CL to other lipids or of CL to the protein. And I don't have time to get into this in great detail, but it's to some extent discussed in our uh, published work and as well as much other literature in the field. So we see that the peroxidase activity really depends on uh, the lipid and the lipid ratios. And like I said, this is measured both based on uh, uh, actually looking at the lipid oxidation and through other um, assays. So it looks like we can reconstitute some sort of uh, really relevant protein lipid complex um, in our in vitro situations. And so what can we then try to do? Study the structural changes in this uh, membrane bound protein. Now, to make a long story short, uh, through the combined work of Abhishek and Mingye, we were able to get uh, these quite nice looking spectra for the membrane bound cytochrome C, where we can actually get uh, uh, site specific assignments for quite a lot of the residues, partially based on de novo assignments, partially based on similarity to the solution NMR data. And I, here I can point out that solution NMR has been applied to this protein for many years. And so we've had assignments of this going back to uh, very early work in maybe even the 70s and 80s. Um, but if we look at this uh, membrane-bound state of the protein detected by carbon, yeah, carbon detected uh, magic angle spinning solid state NMR, and we look at the reconstructed solution NMR shifts that you can compare one to one, you see that the peak pattern of the alanines is basically the same as we would expect in solution state. 
And if you extend this to other sites that we have assigned, um, so these are some data from uh, Mignet's already published paper, you see that most of them have pretty small chemical shift changes. And, uh, but there are a few sites that have more uh, significant uh, uh, changes compared to the solution state. But the bulk of the signals that you would look at, uh, you would say it looks like it's pretty similar to the solution state. And of course, you can also look at these data and see that it's actually quite ordered and structured under these conditions. So that leaves us to think that the structure of the membrane-bound protein must be in some way similar to the solution NMR structure. And I, I think this is probably a PDP file for a X-ray structure actually, but it's basically the same thing. And what I see here is that the clusters of these uh, greater chemical shift changes coincide with the already uh, previously identified uh, lipid binding site, which is driven by these positively charged amino acids. So in a way it seems, yeah, uh, like the protein is remarkably similar to the solution state. And then I told you before that the lipids have a dramatic effect on the activity of the protein. And so we, of course, also looked at comparisons between different lipids. So you have here mono and polyunsaturated uh, CL versions, and you see that the peaks coincide very well. Uh, you can do the same with TOCL versus DOPG, which also showed in our functional assays significant differences in activity. And also there, the peak positions don't change much. Now, here you can see that part of the features in the spectra you might recognize is that, that there are many fewer peaks. This is some residue-specific labeling of the protein to make some of the interpretation easier. Um, so this is uh, partially unpublished data that we hope to uh, uh, make public relatively soon. So the, the big picture is that we see some chemical shift differences, but not a whole lot. And that the, uh, but where we see bigger effects is in the intensities and the widths of the peaks both between the solution and the, and the solid state, as you might predict, uh, but also between the different lipid species. And we think this points to effects of cytochrome C mobility being modulated by the type of lipid it's bind to. And if you then combine this, uh, these kind of data, so these kind of solid state and MR data, where we look at the uh, uh, peak positions and uh, interpret this uh, alongside with the peak intensities in terms of dynamics, you see that um, there must be specific sites that are mostly affected by mobility, like some residues are more affected than others. And if you then look at other data like uh, tryptophan fluorescence, you can get a similar kind of impression. So what uh, is characteristic about cytochrome C is that a single tryptophan that is quite close to the heme site. So I haven't really dwelled upon this, but in this protein structure, you can see that it has a heme. And this heme is paramagnetic in all the experiments that I've shown you so far. Um, but in the case of the uh, tryptophan fluorescence, the heme also has a quenching effect. And so you actually get quite low um, uh, tryptophan fluorescence. I think in this figure it's not shown, but it's basically close to zero in this figure. If you just have the protein in solution, and the moment you add it to lipids, the fluorescence goes up, showing that uh, this destabilization of the protein core. Yet at the same time, when you do uh, FTIR analysis, you see that the secondary structure is actually pretty much the same. So there's a bit of a funny apparent contradiction, perhaps, that there are these secondary structures that are preserved as a indications of a global fault uh, changing. And you have these um, RNMR data that suggest that the uh, chemical shifts don't change much, but we see changes in dynamics. The way we kind of integrate this together is we believe that you see this correlation between the dynamics and the peroxidase activity, but that this is not due to a global change in the protein fold, but uh, quite localized loop motion. And one question that is kind of interesting in this context that we get a lot from the broader field, because people have studied these behaviors of cytochrome C for many, many years. And you can see here, uh, a lot of different groups have looked at this. I just focused on some of the older ones relating also to some people doing NMR, including my uh, uh, master's project advisor, Antoinette Kilian in Utrecht, have looked at a cytochrome C and found lots of evidence that the protein unfolds on the membrane. And this brings me to uh, some new data that we have been uh, recording recently, which uh, identifies some interesting features. So if you uh, take the membrane and you load it up with lots of protein, as you're tempted to do to get decent NMR spectra, what you see is that the peak patterns uh, are like the ones that I've shown you before. 
But if you take exactly the same conditions and you diminish the amount of protein, so you give more uh, freedom on the membrane to the individual protein molecules, you see that under the same conditions, there are many fewer peaks. And the interesting thing is that this kind of phenomenon is also what you see if you take this sample to a higher temperature. So what we see is if you bring these samples to an even lower temperature, like you more, freeze more and more of the water in the sample actually, you see that the uh, peak patterns now become quite similar to what we see at higher temperatures for this uh, more densely packed sample. So it appears that the packing density of these peripherally bound proteins on the membrane surface uh, actually has a great effect on the mobility of the protein and that you get specific um, uh, regions of the protein that maintain or lose their uh, stable fold. Of course, the interesting thing about the NMR data is we can start to pinpoint some of the sites that are most preserved under these conditions. And one of the things we, we included in our experiments is this bottom spectrum here where we added urea to show that, yeah, all these data are definitely not consistent with a completely unfolded protein or that you couldn't freeze out the motion in the unfolded protein uh, because the urea spectrum is dramatically different. Like you see much less dispersion of the peaks. So it does look to us like we have a uh, highly dynamic state on the, on the membrane that requires us to do quite extensive cooling of the sample and partial freezing of the sample to get these kind of spectra. And that this um, degree of dynamics can be up and down regulated by things like the protein to lipid ratio, uh, as well as the type of lipid you use. And it led us to this idea that, um, well, we can first of all reconstitute this kind of in vivo activity in our in vitro conditions and see this lipid dependent activity. And it brought us to this idea that these polyunsaturated fatty acid cardiolipins are preferred substrates partially because of the chemical reactivity, but also partially because they are particularly effective at dynamically activating the protein. So I don't, what I didn't point out is that the PG versus CL comparison showed us that the CL is better at mo mobilizing the protein than the, than the PG lipids. And so we now argue that this shows that this substrate here, the, the lipid itself, uh, activates the protein by changing its dynamics. So that's led us to suggest that they are uh, like substrate-based dynamic activators of the cytochrome C uh, peroxidase activity. So that was kind of the main topic that I wanted to kind of talk about, but I couldn't resist quickly mentioning um, a kind of very qualitatively similar idea that we see in some work that we just published together with the group in Texas of uh, Lucas Joachimiak, where we looked at these oligomeric chaperones. And I don't really have time to get into it in detail, but it connects to the kind of work that we, uh, many of you have seen me talk about quite a lot as our studies of Huntington's disease and the polyglutamine proteins involved in there. And what we have done is we've published several papers studying the structure of these polyglutamine fibers uh, including last year our, our new model that kind of integrates a lot of data, including EM results. And what we found is that this beta hairpin structure is really critical in this. And what drew our attention is that it's been suggested that certain chaperones that are really good against polyglutamine might recognize these beta hairpin structures. So we're now setting out to kind of to study how these proteins behave. But one interesting feature is that they're actually oligomeric in their native state. And so what we started to do is, with the help of our collaborators, study these oligomeric chaperones in, uh, in this case, different salt conditions. And you see the selective mobilization of specific domains, the J domains, which are really uh, important for activating the HSB70 uh, downstream chaperone. So I don't really have time to get into this in, in any detail now, but uh, people that are interested in these topics should really read our, our paper. Uh, with a lot of cool work done by uh, my postdoc, Irina, who is uh, actually now also in Groningen with me here. So I wanted to leave it at this and, uh, yeah, again, mention the people that did most of the work on the projects that I've mentioned here, the Abhishek and ming -Yay. Um The uh, collaborations with Valerian Kagan have been really instrumental and he's really been uh, great to work with on this and other extensions of this work. The proteins in the data that I discussed were all produced uh, together with Jin Wu An, so who did it in his group in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, but the project was partially yeah, bootstrapped or started up together with Judith Klein Sita Raman when she was still in Pittsburgh, but she's now in, in Denver. And then the DNAJB8, that, that new paper of ours, is done together with Lucas 
and Brian uh, in uh, uh, at UT Southwestern uh, in Texas. And that's all I, oh yeah, and I should say that the, the, all the lipid work was published uh, thanks to, or was performed thanks to R1 funding from the NIH that I had in the States. And I welcome any questions people might have. Thanks Patrick for the very interesting talk. There's some questions in the Q&A already and um, you can always add more and go vote for those of you in the audience. So I'll start with um, Martina Huber asks, uh, since you mentioned the special function of cardiolipin, there seems to be a question about what the charge of the head group of CL is. What's your opinion about the charge state? So you could, could you comment on the charge state of CL? Well, I, uh, that's sort of the reason why I put the phosphorus spectrum in, uh, anticipating this question. Um, as I showed, it uh, shows that the lipid is symmetric, which suggests that it cannot, can either be, I mean, it has to be a symmetric charge pattern and that it would support the idea that it's uh, uh, minus two, so fully negatively charged. Uh, there's a really great paper by a group of uh, Edgar Koyman in Ohio at Kent State uh, that had, goes into this in great detail. And uh, so people are interested in this and they really prove this in uh, uh, quite some detail, but it's a negatively, negative two charge, as far as we know, in our conditions. Thanks. So Phil Solenko asked, Patrick, did you add peroxide to your sample to induce lipid oxidation and conversely cytochrome C release from membranes? Uh, yeah, so we, in the assays, of course, there is peroxide present. In the NMR studies, we haven't yet done that. So we haven't yet tried to study the, uh, the ongoing uh, peroxidation process in situ. Um, and I know that there is uh, the idea that the oxidized lipids are less good binding partners and that you would expect a release of the uh, cytochrome C. Then Christoph Grohe says, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. At the comparison between the samples with a more and with less protein per lipid, is the signal to noise of the spectra the same? Uh, well, no, the signal to noise gets worse if you have the less protein, of course, which is why we initially went for the higher ratio of it, uh, having more protein. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's still, yeah, quite manageable to get some level of spectra from there. But it's, yeah, the, the main thing is that when you, uh, yeah, like when you don't cool the sample down and the dynamics suppress the signals that there's not much to see. So then of course the signal to noise gets dramatically worse. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, so well, maybe more generally, when you talk about um, line shape changes and intensity changes, what, uh, what signal to noise level do you need in order to, um, in your, well, in your spectra, what kind of signal to noise do you have to be able to make those kind of statements? Oh, well, this is dramatic changes, not like a 10% yeah. change. So it's like a peak, um, yeah going down to a third of its normal intensity, something like that. Okay. And you saw in the example that like, it's not a subtle change in the spectra here, left and right. You see really dramatic changes. And in our published work, there is a more systematic spectra where you see selective changes in certain peaks uh, as a function of temperature. But then, you, yeah, it's, it's, it's big intensity changes, not a 10% change. Sure, clearly for this protein, that's not an issue. Um, then, um, let's see, um, Ramamurthy asks, uh, well, first of all, excellent talk. Uh, do you think the cardiolipin lipids form a domain in the membrane or does cytochrome C induce a CL rich domain formation upon membrane interaction? Yeah, I, I mean, so that's, that was the, in the title of our paper from two years ago that we actually talk about nano domains. And uh, what we find is that the, the reason for the 6.3 R number here, which I didn't explain, is that this is the number of lipids per, of uh, CL lipids per protein, not lipids in total, but the CL in the sample per available to the protein. If you calculate the area of six cardiolipins, it matches exactly this, the cross section of cytochrome C. So we think that the cytochrome C, um, both in charge and area matches perfectly to the point where the binding saturates. Um, and what, we, what you see if you do a binding curve of the, as a function of the ratio of CL to protein, you see it saturating at a certain point and that's close to this six value. So we're here at, at the saturation point, uh, as I show here, and here we're quite far away from that point. 
And then part two of the question was, how does the change in the dynamics of cytochrome C influence its function? Well, the, the idea is that the heme uh, is buried inside the protein in a native state, um, and which it has to be so that it doesn't start yeah, uh, reacting, uh, causing reactions unnecessarily in the intermembrane space of the mitochondria. And it's covered by this uh, specific loop, this omega loop. And it's specifically that loop that you see experiencing these, uh, a lot of these dynamics. Whereas other parts of the structure are uh, yeah, not affected the same way. The, the, the dynamics map, map onto the foldons. So people that follow the cytochrome C literature, you know that it has these specific foldon domains. The dynamics partially map onto that, but not, not exactly. And that we're hoping to report on that shortly. Uh, so yeah, so the, to answer the question, we think that the loop uh, that covers the heme normally is now becoming flexible and that allows temporary access of the polyunsaturated fatty acids to the heme cavity uh, and the reactive uh, uh, amino acids that are there, the specific tyrosines are implicated in the um, mechanism there. Okay, and then uh, Ralph Bollens asks, um, how does cytochrome C work as uh, peroxidase? Is the heme iron directly involved and forms iron four ferrous state like in lactoperoxidase or another peroxidase? Um, this would also mean that one of the amino acid ligands of cytochrome C would get off. Can uh, reaction intermediate states be seen? Yeah, so some of the amino acids, so the, um, so the, the star here on this figure shows residue 80, methionine 80, which is one of the heme uh, ligands. And indeed, uh, from lots of other data, it's known that that uh, methionine gets dislodged during membrane binding. And indeed, that's also where we see more significant chemical shift changes uh, in the protein. So we think, and that happens to be the same, uh, the same loop. So this is that methionine 80 here in the figure. So it's this key loop that we th think or we see becoming more mobile and that um, manages the access to it. Um, regarding the mechanism, there is evidence that tyrosines in, inside the protein are implicated uh, as intermediates in the uh, oxidation process, um, but we haven't looked at that with the NMR, based on the NMR data per se. And for the oxidation states of the iron, is it known maybe from EPR if it's iron four or? or uh, shuttling between iron four and something else? There's yeah, so the moment you bind to the membrane, the, the oxidation state uh, definitely changes. And you see um, the appearance actually depending on the conditions of multiple different uh, iron states. So you, s you see that in the signal, like from Raman or mm -hmm. uh, EPR data as well. Let's see, there are a few more questions. Uh, another about uh, cardiolipin. It seems it's evolutionary conserved lipid in mitochondria. What's so special uh, that it has to be in the mitochondrial membrane? Well, it, it's, it's thought to originate from the, um, yeah, the evolutionary origin of mitochondria, which are the symbiotic um, uh, bacterial species, right? And bacterial membranes have a lot of CL. Um, why it's crucial is that it actually is a, plays a critical structural role in many mitochondrial proteins, so that many of the mitochondrial proteins wouldn't work if you don't have uh, CL. The interesting thing is there are some studies where people knock out CL and they, um, they see that you could have a partial replacement with PG, which is actually a biological precursor to CL. So PG can kind of uh, recapitulate some of the functionality of CL, but it's, yeah, it's you, you're not as good. Um, another one about uh, binding of CL. Does, it, does cytochrome C also bind oxy-CL? Um, could you comment on what protein oxidizes cardiolipin? Uh, yeah, so here we see the peroxidation of the, ox of the CL in the absence of any other protein, right? It's just pero like peroxide, cytochrome C and, and lipids. So we don't need another protein to get the oxidation reaction per se. There is evidence, there are data that show that if you oxidize the CL, 
that the binding, the affinity between cytochrome C and the CL becomes much weaker and you get a release. So there is at least one paper that has reported this. But as I said, we haven't yet actually done that experiment of uh, having the in-situ oxidation and see what that does to our NMR spectra, uh, which would be sort of easy to do because all we need to do is probably add peroxide, peroxide, but we haven't done it yet. Then the last question is on why there's a difference between the IR and the NMR. So the concentration dependent NMR spectra showing really dramatic changes and the IR spectrum showing basically no changes. Um, asking, uh, let's see, basically why does this not match uh, with this indicating global fold? As you mentioned, the global fold is basically the same. Yeah, well, I, I think the, the IR is predominantly sensitive. I think it's referring to, um, to these data. So these are data that we published back in 2015. Um, and this IR is mostly sensitive to the secondary structure and the, um, as is the, the NMR chemical shift. Um, these tryptophan data are more sensitive to the global fold. And I think the, the, make, the way you make this consistent is to assume that um, under these conditions, like up here, where the, many of the peaks disappear in this cross polarization spectrum, that the protein still maintains its secondary structure, but that it becomes dynamic in an intermediate motion regime where the peak intensities are just lost. But, and this is confirmed by the fact that if we do uh, inept-based spectroscopy, like at orthopsy, uh, but also inept one these, we hardly see any signals of the protein here. So it's not like it becomes unfolded, but it probably retains its secondary structure, uh, even in this dynamic state. So following up on this a little bit, could you rule out that the whole protein itself um, has a global motion leading to um, loss of peak intensities like uh, well that that's been my 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 working model up to now has been that, that a, a big factor that makes our nmr work uh terribly without the, the low temperatures is that the the membrane as a whole is highly fluid so we do all this work with unsaturated lipids either monounsaturated or polyunsaturated such that the lipids remain fluid even when we cool the sample down a lot um and that these membrane dynamics and, and undulations that that drives a lot of the dynamics that causes trouble in the NMR. So that is my yeah, idea that that, that that is what's behind it. Um, and that by freezing the sample uh, to a certain degree, not completely, but partially, we remove a lot of these overall motions rather than local motions. Um, but the, the reason why I say we have evidence for local motions is that we have effects like, I mean, you can see it a bit here that we have here the four uh, these four signals here, and only two of them remain. So that you clearly see that parts of the protein become more mobile than other parts, even for identical amino acids. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Patrick, have you uh, on, the, on this comment? Have you tried to uh, to uh, you know change the the lipid composition, adding cholesterol, for instance, to create a lipid raft in there or something like that to make it more rigid? Yeah, I've thought about it, but. Uh, yeah, th there's always the question of biology. Um, the, the mitochondrial membrane lacks, it, it is quite low in, in cholesterol under normal conditions. And so the, it doesn't make that much biological. No, I just meant to, to check on the hypothesis that actually this was the fluidity of the membrane was uh, related to the spectroscopy. Yeah, yeah, I, I, we thought about it, but we haven't done it at this point. Um, so we, uh, we, could, we could try that. I had, sort of other ideas like to support the membranes in some way so that they become less mobile, those kind of ideas to see if that has an effect on the overall mobility of the, of the membranes. Uh, so, but we have done in our published work, we've looked, compared mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids, and then you see the expected pattern that you would. Uh, yeah, that, that, that should make it as well. Yeah.